as I've been praying about what we were going to talk about this morning and the passage of Hebrews that we were going to be in, I, I've had a really fun week because I've been able to talk with uh, quite a few of us. And, and really what I've been talking about is your decision to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, Leslie, remember, we, we turn the sanctuary around and face the baptismal pool because we want that reminder every time that we gather in here that this is the central aspect of our worship. We believe in what Jesus did at the cross, and so we followed him into the waters of baptism, right? And we came up out of those waters, and Gail, the whole room sings, I've decided to follow Jesus, there's no turning back. And that's the declaration we made the day that we got baptized, but you know, the reality is that every single time, every single time, I say to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to pursue healing because I don't want to be broken anymore. I want to be made whole. Every time I do that, Kathy, I'm looking at Jesus and I'm saying, in this area of my life, I've decided to follow you. And there's no turning back. <laughs> every time I look at the Lord and say, I want to be made holy. You know, I, I look at my God and I say, this week, Lord, my temper um, may have flared, <laughs> and that didn't look a thing like you. Lord, I, I want the fruit of your spirit to be present in my life. Then I'm saying to him, God, I want this mess to be made holy, and I've decided to follow you on a journey to deal him with my temper, and there's no turning back. Every single time I take a step towards holiness, I take a step towards wholeness, that's the declaration that I'm making. And I don't know about you guys, but when I start that, the first time, and I say, yes, it's always because I have great confidence that God can do it. You know, I heard a great sermon, or he spoke to me through his word, or I just messed something up so royally that I'm like, Lord, you've got to fix this. <laughs> I start with great confidence, with this total expectation that the Lord's going to bring me on a journey that leads me in that area of my life towards holiness and wholeness, and I am full speed ahead until I hit a few roadblocks. You know, like I'm full speed ahead on, Lord, you can deal with my temper until somebody ticks me off. And then there are just necessary words to speak right then, not ones you speak in church. I'm, I'm full speed ahead. I said, Lord, we can do this until he asks me to give up something. And I'm not entirely positive that it's an equal exchange. Or, or I'm with him. And I said, God, I believe that you can make me whole until I come toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, with the thing that actually caused me to be broken. And suddenly it seems really big, and it seems very scary. And this is all wonderful, and I, I had, in fact, decided to follow Jesus, but now I'm turning back. I'm most definitely turning back. Been there and done that? The passage of Scripture that we're dealing in today in Hebrews chapter 3 is spoken to people who have decided to follow Jesus. Man, we're pursuing holiness, we're pursuing wholeness, but we've hit the roadblocks. And what I'd like us to do today as we look at this passage is first to just identify what are the sticky points? Now, what are the places on our journey towards holiness and wholeness where the evil one's going to come and he's going to tempt us to change our tune <laughs> and turn back? And then what I'd also like us to talk about is why we don't have to do that. How it is that we can help each other to push through the places where the obstacles show up and we'd like to just quit because we know what Jesus has for us. So if you would, open your Bibles. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to pick up at verse 7 and read through verse 19. And we're going to read the whole thing together, and then we'll go back, and we'll talk it through. Hebrews 3, beginning of verse 7, going through to 19. The author says, So as the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes Psalm 95. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and they tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That's why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they will never enter my rest." See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. 
As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Now, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? With whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? To whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. This is the word of our God, and our thanks belongs to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's, let's take a look at this passage of scripture for a second, guys. Now, the author of Hebrews, right, he is making use of the people of Israel, and specifically, right, their journey from Egypt. Oh, look, here it is. From Egypt all the way to the promised land, right? He's making, he's looking at what we would talk about as the exodus. And he says, let's talk about the people of Israel and their journey, actually their failed and aborted journey into the promised land as an example of how not to follow Jesus, right? He quotes Psalm 95, which is a psalm of David that is about the exodus. And if we were going to boil down what he's saying, he says essentially this. He says, the people of Israel, they began over here in Egypt with great confidence that God was going to bring them to the promised land. They started out gung-ho. They start out believing we're going to, they sing in their own song, right? I have decided to follow Yahweh. Like it? Isn't that beautiful? I try. You don't laugh. Anyhow, they started with great confidence over here. They said, we're going to follow the Lord all the way to the promised land. And they were 100% on board. But as they got into this journey, it didn't take them very long before their great confidence turned into great unbelief. And if you know this story, you know that those people, the very people who started out with such great confidence, who had all the promises of God that they were going to the promised land, never got there. And they spent 40 years walking with the Lord. They spent 40 years talking to him every day. 40 years eating bread from heaven. But they never actually get to where he promised to take them. And the author of Hebrews says it was because in that time period, their hearts caused them to turn away from God. That they started with great confidence, but something changed. And he said their hearts became sinful and unbelieving. And it was the unbelief within their own bodies, their unbelief about who God was, that made it so they never actually got where they started out to go and where God wanted them to go. Now, Rob, the the author of Hebrews, the title of it should give you a good indicator to what I'm about to say. He was writing to the Hebrew people. (laughs) He was writing to Jewish Christians who were steeped in the Old Testament. So he's writing with the assumption that they know all about the great confidence, the promised land, and the unbelief. So he just sort of skips all the details and says, I presume you learned this. Most of us probably know it, but I think we better go into the details. Because it's in the details, guys, that we actually discover where you and I have our own unbelief issues. So let me recap the story for you a little bit. Let's start talking about their great confidence, right? The people of Israel, you remember that they were in the land of Egypt for 430 years, and they were slaves there, right? That they're who built the big pyramids. They were enslaved to an evil master, an evil Pharaoh, who looked at the people of, of Israel, and he said, essentially, you guys are a dime a dozen, and I'm going to work you literally until you die, because they didn't have any worth outside of what they were able to do. Well, Yvonne, they'd been there for 430 years, and the book of Exodus opens with God showing up. And God shows up, and he says to the people of Israel, I need you to have great confidence in who I am, right? So he institutes the ten plagues. If you look at the ten plagues, you know that each one of them is God exposing and then proving that he's better than the Egyptian gods, right? So, for instance, uh, the Egyptian god of the sun, right? One of the plagues, the Lord causes the whole land of Egypt to go in the dark. It's noontime, and it's just totally dark. And scripture says they can't even see their hand in front of their face, you know? Yeah, ever gone spelunking, caving? You go on the little cave tours, and you get halfway in, and then they turn the lights out on you? That's why I don't go on those. <laughs> Spencer's like, no, that ain't happening. It's awful. You can't see anything. Okay, that was the land of Egypt. But the land of Goshen, where the Hebrew people lived, had broad daylight. God was saying to the people of 
Egypt and to the people of Israel, I'm the real deal. The Egyptian gods are not. And all ten of the plagues, he systematically goes through the Egyptian gods to give the people of Israel confidence that they got a really big God. He's really powerful, and he can outdo anybody else. We keep going from there, right? He brings them on this lovely journey where he could have just taken them up here, see, all land. And instead, he brings them to the Red Sea, right? And he makes the people of Israel cross the Red Sea. He makes the dry land where there once had been water because he wants to give them great confidence. No matter what you come up against, I can bring you through. When they get to the other side and we got a million people and no acme, the Lord says to them, I can feed you. And every single day he gives them manna, right? Every day they go out and they scoop up this, this like flour and they make bread from it. And it says it's the bread from heaven. Friends, we're not talking Collegeville Bakery, right? Heaven. They start this journey with such incredible confidence, and they're willing to go with God because he told them where he's taken them. He said, I'm going to bring you to the promised land. And he described this land as a land flowing with milk and honey. (laughs) That sounds sticky to me, but apparently it's good. He said, it's a land where you're going to have everything that you're going to need. And more importantly, it's a land where you will no longer be slaves of an evil master. It's a land where you're going to be free to serve me and me alone. If we look at this, right, and this is our story, then we'd have to replace Egyptian gods being defeated with with our own. I mean, I have confidence in how big God is because of your stories of how you have seen him work in your life. And our promised land is not Canaan, and it's not sticky. Our promised land is that we have a God who says, I take messy people, and I can make you holy. And I have broken people, and I can bring you to wholeness. That's our promise. Just like God gave to the people of Israel. Now the question is, will we walk the journey with him from where we are today to where he's taking us tomorrow? If you know the story of the people of Israel, you know it didn't take them long before their great confidence became great unbelief. Matter of fact, it only took about three months. Get my thing to turn back on. In three months, maybe, here we go, they end up down here in this general region, a region called Rephidim, right? And this is in Exodus 17, if you want to check it out. They get down here, and, and rainy in three whopping months from when God miraculously makes dry ground where there was a sea, they show up in the tried and true desert, okay? In the city, that, or the, the village, I guess, that they came to, there's no river, there's no lake, there's no well, there's no spring, there's no water. And that's not good news when you got about a million people. So they get to this place. Three months in, they're singing, I've decided to follow Yahweh. I'm going with him. I know he's going to bring me to the promised land. They land in Rephidim. There's no water. And all of a sudden, their song changes. And the next thing you know, the people of Israel come to Moses, and they start to get very angry. And they say, well, wait a minute. Why did God bring us out of Egypt just so we can die? Why did he bring us out of here and then abandon us? And they start to ask questions of Moses. They say, is God even here? He pro- this was a trick. He told us to come out of Egypt. He told us he's taken us to the promised land. And now he's just up and left us. You got to love it, right? They stand here in the middle of this desert and they look at the God who just made dry land where there was water. And they say to him, you cannot put water where there is dry land. But Irving, the question in their heart, their sinful, unbelieving heart, this question is about to make them turn around. Because they've reached this point where all of a sudden they've decided God's gone. Because now they've got a problem where they're actually going to have to trust him. You know, up until this point, they were just going for a walk. Now they've reached a point where they've got to actually trust this God. And the second they hit the point where they have to, they can't do it, they've got to trust God, They've decided he's abandoned them, and he's gone. I have this sneaking suspicion you and I have had that happen too. Like we've looked at the Lord, and and let's say God spoke to us, and he said, I'm calling you into holiness in your finances. And and maybe you, you heard the Lord speak to you about the tithe, right? You know that thing that we like to not talk about? 
where God says the base of what we are to give him is 10% of everything that he gives to us. So let's say you said yes to that wild and crazy concept of obedience. And you said, all right, Lord, I'm going to tithe. And, and everything goes okay for the first couple, three months. And you're good. So, Lord, I have decided to follow you. You get 10%. There is no turning back. Three months in, the water heater breaks. The car explodes, and David tries as hard as he can, and he cannot fix it for you. Three months in, there's whispers of layovers at work. Three months in, something happens that makes you all of a sudden go, Are you kidding me, God? I did what you asked me to do, and now you just abandoned me? That's the moment where all of a sudden we're probably about ready to turn around. Because that's the moment. This is the first point when we've had to actually trust him. And when we reach that point, for a lot of us, that's when we're ready to exit stage left. Because the evil one starts to tempt us, and we start to decide, I don't think God's actually with me. He's not actually in this. He brought me out here, and he's going to abandon me. Same thing's true if, let's say, you felt like the Lord invited you to take on a new job or a new ministry, and you get in it, and all of a sudden you realize, boy, i got a terrible boss, or this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And all of a sudden we're looking at God going, was, was this a setup? Were you just messing with me? You, I thought you were coming with me. Where are you at right now? When we reach this point, this is the first moment when all of a sudden we're ready to turn around. We'll talk in a minute what we better do about that, but first we've got to keep going on their journey. See, the people of Israel kept going on their journey. God did, in fact, give them water, by the way. About a year later, they've been on this journey for about a year, they wake up one day, Brandon, and they decide, you know what? We're kind of sick of this manna thing. You know, the truth of the matter is that the Lord gave the people of Israel manna every single day for a very simple reason. I mean, part of it is that they learned that they could trust God every day to provide for them. But, Lord, there's a more basic reason than that. If he hadn't given them manna, they were going to have to put down roots, (laughs) start tilling soil, irrigating the land, and planting so that they could eat. Linda, if he had not given them manna every single day, he hadn't given them this bread from heaven, they were never going to leave the wilderness. They would have had no other option but to somewhere set up camp over here somewhere, even though God had called them up here, (laughs) because they needed to eat. When God gave them manna, he was saying, for the purposes of this journey, I don't want you to stop. I do not want you to decide that the wilderness is your new home. I I don't want you to stay here. I want you to get to the promised land. So here's the deal. We're going to do an exchange. (laughs) You don't get the foods that you used to have in Egypt, but I will give you food that is served in heaven so that you'll keep going. When you get to the promised land, boy, he promised them there was all sorts of good eating once they got there. (laughs) Numbers chapter 11, though, about a year in, the people of Israel come together and they say, you know what? We're not sure this is worth it. We're not entirely positive this was a good exchange. And I'm not even making this part up. They come to Moses and they say, listen, we have eaten the bread from heaven every single day. But do you understand that we have had to give up, are you ready? Garlic. We had to give up onions. We had to give up cucumbers and melons and fish, all of which we had for, at no cost to us, direct quote, when we were in Egypt. You catch them? So they come before the Lord and they say, when we were slaves and we were being used and abused until we died and fed only so that we could keep working, we had all of this lovely, wonderful food. It was better when I was a slave than it is over here, eating what God is giving to me. They came to this point where they started to say, is the process worth it? Because they could abort. All they had to do was stop, start uh, trying to plant right there in the wilderness, and they could have had all the garlic and onions and melons they'd ever wanted again. They're asking God, is it worth it? Is the process to the promised land worth it when i got to make an exchange? I know what that's like. 
So for some of us, let's say that your slavery, that the Lord just spoke to you of, and he promised you, he says, man, I can give you freedom, is your Egypt was needing other people to tell you uh, how good you are. And you just enslaved to needing somebody to pat you on the back and say, I appreciate you and I value you. You need words of affirmation from other human beings. And if the Lord spoke to you and he said, I can bring you to a promised land where you're set free, you're free to just be you and to be who you were made to be and to know that you have value even if nobody ever says it. And let's say that you started out with great confidence. I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him and I'm going to let him define who I am, not other people, okay? About a year in. I bet you look at the Lord one day and say, but, 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 but Lord... <laughs> I got what scripture says, and it's a very nice trade-off, and I know that it's, it's what they say about me in heaven, but I kind of miss, I miss manipulating people into telling me what I want to hear. I miss getting people to stroke my ego. I, I miss that, Lord. Is it worth it? And really what we're saying is I think it might have been better off in slavery than it will be in the promised land. Same thing happens if you come to the Lord and you say, God, I really want to pursue wholeness. I want to deal with the with the mess that's inside of me. I want to know inner healing. So you start that process. You begin walking towards those places of healing. Do you know somewhere along the lines, the Lord's going to say, okay, if you really want to be made whole, we have to do an exchange. I'm going to give you gentleness and patience and peace, and you have to give up the bitterness and the unforgiveness that is very familiar to you that you've been holding on to. And odds are real strong we're going to reach that point and go, is it worth it? Lord, I'm not so sure, because this feels very comfortable, this unforgiveness and bitterness that I know. I know how to be a slave. Lord, do I, do I really believe it's worth it to pursue freedom? Somewhere along the lines, in everybody's journey towards holiness and wholeness, we reach a point where we say, God, I don't know about this process. And the Lord's going to speak to us and say, sometimes I had to take some things away so that you'll keep moving. But the question is, will we trust him when we reach that point? Just right after the people of Israel reached that place of asking, is he worth it? That's Numbers 11. In Numbers 13 and 14, they finally come to the point where they can actually, they're up here at uh, Kadesh Barnea, they can actually go into the promised land. Like, they finally made it. And you know what happens, right? So Numbers 13 and 14, uh, the Lord has them send 12 spies into the land of Canaan just to scout it out. Come back, tell us what you saw, right? So they're there for 40 days. When they come back, they say to Moses and Joshua and the people of Israel, they say, well, the promised land is a better promise than what God told us. <laughs> it's, it's even better. The food there, Egypt had nothing on it. <laughs> the land is fertile, it's beautiful, it's huge. It's, it's everything that God promised us it would be. There's just one hiccup. There's giants in it. And so there's this very tall people, and they are so much bigger than us. Clearly, they must be bigger than God. Ten of the 12 spies come back to the people of Israel and say, it's a great land, we should go there, we really ought to, but we can't. The giants are just too big. Two of the 12 look back and say, are you joking? Do you not know how big our God is? But they lose. And Jocelyn, that's the end. For the next 40 years, they wander around here. They never actually get into the promised land because they got so close they could see it. And then they said, the giants are too big, we can't go there. I know that story too, right? I mean, let's be realistic. If you're going to pursue wholeness, if you, you genuinely believe that God can bring you to the promised land, you, you could probably survive when things start to get uncomfortable and the first time you have to actually trust him to be God. You could probably even make it through the point of the, of the exchange and saying, Lord, I... I'm not so sure that what you're taking me to is actually better than the slavery I'm familiar with. But if you're genuinely pursuing wholeness, you know, there will come a point where, where you're going to recognize that you have to take out the giant of addiction and the giants of brokenness who are lined up behind him because he just numbs them. If you're going to get to wholeness, you're going to have to deal with that addiction. And that's going to get scary. Or you're going to say, okay, okay. 
Lord, I really want to be holy, and, and I want my mouth to honor you. Cool. At some point, you're going to come up against toe-to-toe, you and your tongue. And it seems like a really big giant in those moments. You say, Lord, I, I want to be made holy, so you want to pursue uh, healing. Well, you're, one day you're going to have to go to battle with the things that happened in your past and, and the ways that they impact you today. And that's probably going to be scary. You say, Lord, I want, I want sexual holiness in my life. You're going to have to go up against this world that says that's unnecessary, that it isn't right that people who are single be celibate and that people who are married only be in sexual relationship with each other. You're going to have to go toe-to-toe against pornography and all of the mess that is present in our world. And when you hit the giant, the real question that we're asking at that moment is not, am I big enough, but is God big enough? Can my God actually defeat whatever this giant is so I can go into the promised land? I walk us through their whole story because I think it's ours. At least this part of it. That any time I begin my journey with the Lord with great confidence, something comes up. (laughs) I don't get very far in before all of a sudden I'm saying, God, are are you even here? Do, do, you, do you remember me? Do you care about me? You started me on this journey. Or I'll come to a point where I'm going to say, Lord, is it worth it? Is the process towards holiness and the process towards wholeness, is it worth engaging in? Are you actually going to give me something that's worth doing all this in the end? Or I'll reach a point where I come up against the giant and I decide, Lord, this sounded great in theory one Sunday morning, but I, I see that giant live and in color. I was stupid. And I'm going to turn around. This part of our story, guys, I I think it's just like the Israelite story because it's the story of the story of coming to know how big and good our God is. The question is, can we change the end of the story? Because the Israelites never got there. And I was hit that hit me this morning when I was praying. You know, Gail, they spent 40 years with God right in their midst. They spent 40 years eating his food. They spent 40 years being led by him. They spent 40 years worshiping him. We're not talking they spent 40 years just turning their backs on God. They spent 40 years with him. And they still never got to the promised land. I don't want that to be my story. I don't want to spend the next 40 years serving God and worshiping God and loving God, but never actually believing that he's here, he's worth it, and he's able and therefore not getting to the holiness and the wholeness that he wants to give me today. And I don't want us there either. I want our stories to be different. And in Hebrews 3, the author of Hebrews told us how it gets to be different. And he told us two things, both of which, by the way, are in our mission statement. If it will go. Mr. Matt, you want to help me out? Thank you. Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, we have a name for that. It's called shepherding. Like it? What you and I have in this knowledge of Jesus Christ is we have the power in one another's lives to help each other's story not look like the Israelites. Now, what do I mean? I mean, there are days, guys, when I'm pursuing holiness and I'm pursuing wholeness where I look at the Lord and say, are you joking? Why did you bring me here? Why did you ask me to go this way, to just dump me in this situation right now? And if you know me, and you are in a shepherding kind of relationship with me where where you ask me how I'm doing and I don't just say, great, then you're going to hear me ask that question. Mike, you'll you'll hear it in the things I won't say. And some days you'll hear me flat out say, I don't get it. God brought me, I thought. I thought he said we were headed towards wholeness. But he stuck me in this situation. And I'm starting to feel like he's not even present. Or I feel like this isn't worth it. Or I think he can't possibly defeat the giant that I just realized is in my life. When you hear me say that, would you encourage me 
today, I need you to look at me just like you need me to look at you, and we need each other to look at one another when we're asking those questions and say, wait a minute, that's not who your God is. See, if you leave me of my own devices, just like the Israelites got left to their own devices, we're going to come up against those sticking points, and we are, in fact, going to turn around because our hearts become hard, and they become unbelieving, and that's when we turn. I need you to encourage me as long as it's called today. Guess what? You're never off the hook. I need you to encourage me as long as it's called today. When you start hearing me ask those questions, just say, hey, Kelly, can I pray with you? Can we look at what God's word said? Sometimes, guys, I find the most great encouragement is when I'm sitting there going, I'm telling you God left me, is when somebody looks back at me and they say, honey, perhaps you just need to open your eyes. Shall I give you the bullet points of all the ways that I can see that God is here and he is present? I need to be encouraged. We need to be encouraged. That's why shepherding one another matters. See, we don't get to do this journey on our own because we'll never get there. Leave me to my own devices. I'm going to tell the Lord, this, this process that we're on, it stinks. I don't like it. So I'm going to just build camp right here, God, and never actually make it to the promised land. I need you to encourage me. And that also means, guys, that we have to be willing to let people encourage us. Did you know that if nobody knows you well enough, to know what the Lord is currently doing in your life, it is mighty hard for them to encourage you. Now, you don't necessarily have to stand up in church and tell the whole world, YouTube included, what it is that God's doing in your life. But boy, there better be one or two people that you're sitting down with on a regular basis and saying, this is what the Lord's bringing me to right now. This is where I'm walking. Do that on the good day so that when you reach the point where you feel like, I don't think he's here, or this is worth it, or he's big enough. There's somebody already ready to speak and say, wait a minute, I remember the great confidence. I know where you were in Egypt. I know where God's taken you to. Let me encourage you. Does that make sense? Let me tell you one more thing that's really cool about this verse. If yesterday your heart was hardened and you did, in fact, turn away from the Lord, today is always a new day. Today is always the day of salvation. Today is always the day we can turn back around. Maybe all we need is somebody to encourage us and be willing to be the encouragement for somebody else. Let me tell you the second part that changes our story, or maybe Mr. Matt will. Thank you. The very next verse in Hebrews 3.14 says, We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence that we had at first. You know, we've come to share in Christ. Other translations will say, we have been made partners with Christ. And we're talking about Christ, we're talking about this part, right? We, our job is to shepherd messy and broken people towards holiness and whole, wholeness through our Savior and Healer. When we talk about partnership in Christ, you know, just gives me this mental image of Jesus coming right alongside me, taking me by the hand and saying, I don't care what you think or what questions you're asking right now, we're partners in this. Now, Jesus has never one time ever asked me to begin in great confidence with him and do a journey without him that leads to the promised land. He said, I'm your partner, and we're going to do this together. And maybe more importantly, my partner he is so much stronger than I am. He's more powerful than I am. He is capable of everything I am not. That's part of what we encourage each other with, but that's also part of what we just get to stand with. In those moments when we reach the sticky place, you need to stop for just one second and be reminded of Hebrews 3.14. You have a partner on this journey. You get a partner who really, really wants you not to wander in the desert for the next 40 years, but to make it to the promised land. He wants us to, in this area of life that he's working on right now, make it to holiness and wholeness. He's not going to let go. Maybe we can just take the next step. Let's pray together. Would you come before, come before your Savior and healer today? And then they give us space to pray. And maybe you need to come today and say, Lord, 
I began in great confidence. But here's the questions that are on my heart. Maybe you're at the place right now where you're thinking, are you even here? Are you worth it? Are you big enough? Maybe, maybe, truth be told, you've been circling in the desert for a long time over this area of holiness and wholeness because you've been too afraid to take on the giant. Maybe today you just need the Lord to remind you that, uh, that you are walking this journey and he is doing it with you. If you need to confess today, if you need to ask the Lord to give you uh, his perspective on where you are at, if you just need to celebrate what your God is doing, Whatever he's doing in your heart this morning, he invites you to pray it with him. Lord God, I thank you for brothers and sisters who, who are on this journey. Each one of us are in a different space. Each one of us have been invited to, to walk with you in a different place of holiness and wholeness. We walk together. God, I pray first today that you would cause us more and more to be a shepherding community, to be a people who are encouraging one another to keep trusting you, encouraging one another to pursue you, encouraging one another not to set up camp in the desert, but to make it to your promised land. So Lord, open us to be a people who are willing to be encouraged. And then empower us, God, to be the people who offer encouragement. Jesus, I thank you for the fact that we truly don't make this journey by ourselves. Today, may we walk in that truth. And this week, when the temptation to turn back comes, this week, Lord, when we, when we reach the place where where we just can't believe you left us here. God, would you speak that truth over us? You have never and you will never leave us. You're our partner in this journey. When we come to the place of saying, God, I, I don't think it's worth it, Lord, would you put an encourager right in our presence who would remind us and paint a picture for us of what freedom in you looks like? And Lord, when we come against the giants and we say, I'm not big enough, Jesus, would, would you just come alongside us, grab our hands and say, it's okay, I am. Lord, I thank you for the journey. But more than that, I thank you for the promises we have in you. Lord, thanks for loving us. We pray these things in your name. And all God's people said.